Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. This is a solo live stream uh, and it is covering uh, one of my favourite topics. It's a topic that I've been uh, I've been doing videos on for quite some time. Let's just get rid of that reverb. I've been doing some videos on for quite some time, lots of different videos about this subject. I don't think I've ever done just an open Q&A on the Crypts of Winterfell. Perhaps I did quite a long time ago, uh, but I thought this is the uh, time to uh, get all of those theories out, get all of those thoughts, that discussion out. I've come up over the course of several uh, uh, videos with what I think is the most likely explanation of what is going on with the Crypts of Winterfell. Um, but Beyond that, there is still a lot that we do not know. So uh, the way that we're going to run this one is as we normally do. I will be uh, framing this around questions I get from my patrons, uh, but I'll be trying to dip into the chat as much as I possibly can as we go along. Uh, if you're watching this uh, live, uh, wondering why in Europe it's an hour or so earlier this week, it's because of the time differences. The, in America, the clocks have gone forward already. Over this side of the Atlantic, they haven't. So uh, I thought, you know what, people keep on asking me to do them slightly earlier for European people. I thought I will keep it the same for those in America and, and people in Europe for about three weeks. We can have live streams a little bit earlier. So that's what's going on there. Um, we did have a few uh, super chats before we went live. So I just want to quickly say thank you to Didelphi Morphia saying, been looking for this forward to this topic for months. Thanks for covering it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, Maura Lee saying, just a show of love, appreciation and support for all the excellent content on IDG and the fabulous stories on the well-told tale. Uh, I love my new IDG mug and mouse mat. Um, you are the best. Thank you. No, thank you, Maura. I really, really appreciate your support. Uh, and I got your questions. Uh, a lot of them were covered by uh, other questions over on Patreon. So uh, I'll be picking up on them through lots of different questions as we go. Um, and Donald Peoples, thank you so much. I saw um, both your question and your super chat. Thank you saying just a bit of appreciation for my favorite YouTuber. Thank you for all of your hard work and excellent content. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, okay guys, let's, uh, let's dive in with uh, what I think is probably one of the most important concepts that we have to understand about the Winterfell Crypts, which is that they're not just normal crypts. These are magical. And let's start as the starting point for this, the question from the second sister saying, hi, Robert, I'm wondering how Winterfell has such a huge weirwood tree. Do you think there is a link with the crypts? Yes, is the short answer. So if you look back at what we think of as Winterfell, the castle, is not what Winterfell was originally. The, the bits of the castle, even the oldest parts of the castle, were built slightly later on. What was there originally, as far as we can tell, was the Weirwood Tree. And then maybe there was some sort of structure above ground that hasn't survived. But then below ground, the crypts. So that is Winterfell. It's the crypts and it's the Weirwood Tree. So is there a link between the two? How is the tree so big? The tree is so big because it has been there for so long. We actually get Bran, who um, towards the uh, end of the, I think it's probably his last chapter, actually, Dance with Dragons, uh, he sees through the Winterfell tree and uh, he sees going back through history and he sees it, it gets smaller. So it is so big because it has been there for so long but it has been there for a very long time and it was there. And the choice to put the crypts where they are is at least partly because there was a weirwood tree above them. They are, if you actually looked at sort of a plan of Winterfell, as much as we can work it out, you get the godswood. Right next to the godswood is the entrance, the crypts. So it's not like they're on a different part of the castle. They are right next to each other. And we would expect with such a huge tree, that the the roots would probably uh, come into or break through the crypts at some point, but there's absolutely no sign of that. So the only hint that, <coughs> pardon me, the only hint that we've got there, I'm just very aware in the current climate, if I ever cough, I'm just going to, oh, oh. Um, but uh, the only hint we ever get is the fact that it does seem as if the, the roots of the weirwood tree are, are not 
breaking in. They're almost protecting the crypts, as it were. So that's what's going on uh, with the link between the two. And there is the very earliest vision that, or bit of history that Brand saw through the, the Weirwood tree it was a sacrifice that was going on there before the Weirwood tree, which seems to imply that the earliest Starks, the first men, were practising sacrifices to the Weirwood tree. They were um, practising the old religion and doing magic sacrifice is what fuels magic in this world. So that's what the link, and, and it's there right from the very beginning. Brand the Builder worked closely with the Children of the Forest. It's, it's sort of hinted at several times. They were involved in the building of these crypts. So this whole setup was done with the, the magic of the weirwood trees and the old religion and the old gods, as it were. So yes, there is an inextricable link between the weirwood tree and the crypts. Um, Violet Ice, uh, just in the chat, saying, I wonder who or what they were sacrificing. Was it ever mentioned? Um, not specifically, but the hint of the language is very, as always with George R. R. Martin, you have to look into the language. The, the hint is that uh, this was a Brandon. So Bran, as he watches it and he sees the sacrifice, it says, and Brandon felt the taste of blood in his mouth, which as Bran is normally referred to as Bran rather than Brandon, that the hint is that this is one of the Brandons, perhaps even the original Bran the Builder. We don't know. That's just a, that's just a, a random theory, or not really a theory, uh, a, a thought that I've got at the back of my brain as to who that might have been. Um, because George R. R. Martin was clearly making the link between the person who was being sacrificed and Bran there in the present day seeing it all. So we don't know who it was, but the hint was that it was a brand. Um, let's go to a question from Peter Pebble saying, Hi, Robert, do you think there might be tunnels connecting the Winterfell crypts to other parts of Westeros? Could this be a way for Bran to get from Blood Raven's cave to Winterfell? Could we see the survivors of the battle against the others escape through these tunnels? Uh, so, yes, there could well be. As with a lot of these things, we, we haven't seen them. Nobody said that there are tunnels going out from the crypts, so this is just working off the logic of other things that we know. But it certainly makes sense. There are clearly lots of um, tunnels from Blood Raven's Cave, uh, and there's a well supported fan theory that the escape that they make in the books, uh, they being Bran and Mira. Are, it will be through the tunnels rather than just sort of above ground trying to outrun uh, the, the the others and, and the whites. So I, I quite like that idea. There certainly are tunnels under the wall uh, or legends and rumours of them at least. And Winterfell itself, as it is described, has got tunnels, secret tunnels, which which sound almost like the insides of weirwood roots. Bran, in uh, I think his first or second chapter, he talks about how there's there's one going all the way through the, the curtain wall around Winterfell. There's this small sort of circular tunnel that goes there that it doesn't sound like it's made for humans to sort of walk or march around there. It's it's only children can sort of scurry through it. So there does seem to be a lot of tunnels going on. And it does kind of make sense that there is a link across into this oldest part of Winterfell, the, the crypt. So yes, that certainly makes sense. It certainly also makes sense that this might be a way that people can get out afterwards if as I suspect may happen, the battle for Winterfell is lost, but we'll get onto that a little bit later on. Um, 
Uh, Nadim Atalia saying, could the Horn of Juraman be used to resurrect the dead Starks? Yes, but I will get onto that one in a moment. Um, and all the people talking about, will will we get more about this in the Winds of Winter? I feel sure we will probably also, the mo most of it we'll probably get in A Dream of Spring, but we'll probably get some more hints in uh, the Winds of Winter. Um, question from Kalisa over on Patreon, saying, I'd love to hear your thoughts on any potential volcanic activity underneath Winterfell and the idea that the contents of the crypts could be key to unlocking and unleashing that. Um, there's a link across potentially to the Doom of Valyria um, and um, are there, yeah, so is there any sort of geographical hint here? Are there significant mountains mentioned nearby which could be dormant volcanoes? Is there any foreshadowing of this? I think there, so beneath Winterfell, uh, one of the other things there, one of the other reasons probably why this place was chosen is because they have hot springs. Now, in the north, it, with the cold winters, these are clearly invaluable. And these aren't just like slightly warm water bubbling to the surface. This is when it rises uh, to the surface, it is steaming hot. They they run it through the walls of the, the castle uh, to warm the castle. That's that's how hot it is. It's it gets um it's almost boiling water. So there are it would appear clearly some hot springs somewhere underneath Winterfell. It does this seem to um, imply that there is some sort of volcanic activity? Well, I'm I'm not a geographer, so I I would leave it to other people to say what that uh, means. But uh, there are some mountains just to the north of um, uh, Winterfell. Um, well, a few miles north of Winterfell. So yes, there are mountains around there. It's not that there aren't any mountains in the area. There isn't anything that has been talked of in a kind of a volcanic way, as if there were, there used to be volcanoes and now there aren't. Um, the link across to Valyria is quite interesting because we get three places where we get these uh, many mentions of these sort of uh, underground. Um, almost volcanic activity. One is, of course, Valyria. The, the second is Dragonstone. And the third is Winterfell. And there clearly is a sort of a, a link across between these three different places, a thematic link at the very least. Now, in Valyria, uh, the, the volcanoes seem to have been held in, uh, in, uh, at a, in abeyance by fire mages. That seems to have been what was happening. The Valyrians had fire mages down there who were basically stopping the place blow up. Um, and so the clear implication is that what happened with the Doom of Valyria is that somebody killed, and I won't get into who, uh, I've done videos on it if you're interested, uh, but somebody killed the fire mages and that uh, meant, created the explosion. So that seemed to be what was going on there. In Dragonstone, uh, it's the, the hot, um, springs as, as it were seem they smell sulfurous this is something which doesn't really come across on the show but in the books dragonstone is is it stinks it's a horrible place to be this is why uh stannis didn't you know he viewed it as an insult to be posted there because yes it might have been an ancestral home of the valyrians but it's not a nice place it's this rocky smelly steamy uh outcrop of an island um, so uh, that there's clearly a lot going on there. Winterfell, they seem to have been tamed in a way that it's been used and there is no hint that there has been any volcanic activity, certainly not in the history of Winterfell. And I, I, I've not looked for it, but off the top of my head, I can't think of any foreshadowing that there might be some sort of volcano um, or, or an eruption. I don't think that's what's going on there. I think that... Um, that and the ice dragon stuff we might come on to an ice the, the ice dragon uh, rumors are more to do with foreshadowing of john who is both ice 
Starkish and fire, Targaryenish. So, what symbolizes ice and fire? Well, lots of things dragon glass does, but so does an ice dragon. So, I think that those kinds of things are foreshadowing John, not suggesting that there's going to be some sort of volcanic eruption. If that makes sense. Uh, Elizabeth Clare, thank you so much for the super chat and saying, please answer the question asked by Joe. Baggins. I love it when people do this, by the way. Thank you so much. That's very generous when somebody does a super chat saying answer the question of, of, from someone else, because I know not everyone uh, can do super chats. Um, uh, I'm going to assume it's this question from a little bit back saying, Robert, what's your favourite aspect of the law in A Song of Ice and Fire? I'm a big fan of the myst mysteries such as the deep ones, a shy, the long night, etc. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, it's a cop out to say all of it. What I but what I love is is the legends and the way that you you get legends in in our world. You get myths and legends which are taken through history, not just as well. Here's a cool story, but they're there to be teaching people about the world, about how social structures work. Um, about um, values and morals and things like that. And so the stories that we get passed down to us through the ages are different generations' ways of trying to show these uh, different stories and, and these different values. And that's what George R. R. Martin does. He manages to weave uh, things that may well have some foreshadowing for actual events. And I'm thinking, for example, of the rat cook here, which is a story that we heard up um, at the night fort. Um, that was actually a story which is about guest right and the importance of guest right. Um, and that would be the story we shared to show what how important guest right was and how, you know, if somebody is your guest and you've given them uh, uh, your honor that they are going to be protected you have to uphold that so probably my favorite aspect of, of the law is the way that George R. R. Martin doesn't just create a, a story or a bit of back history as foreshadowing for something that's going to happen but also to show the creation of the wider um uh, the wider world, the the, the 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 layers of society that exist in any real world. So that, for me, that is the the thing that I like the most. Um, uh, okay, let's. Just having a quick flick through, make sure I've not missed any more. Um, I think that's. Here, um, Valkana Nublet saying the answer is simple. There is a dragon below Winterfell. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out now and say, I see no evidence that there is a dragon below Winterfell. Um, the hot springs have been there forever. It's not that there is a dragon that was there. Dragon eggs were hatched there, or anything like that. It's that it is volcanic activity. So the idea that there's a dragon there, I think, is George R. R. Martin trying to give his foreshadowing of John. Think that's what it is. Um, there is a dragon in Winterfell. There's a Targaryen in Winterfell. Is what he's trying to be saying. Um, uh, talking of which, uh, Fedra the Beloved says, "Hey Robert, do you believe that an ice dragon called Winter is chained deep down below Winterfell? Maybe in the section that is cut off from the rest of the crypts. Could that be how Winterfell got its name? And is that?" Um, and is that ice dragon some sort of god to the others? So I, I don't think so. As I say, I, I haven't seen any evidence for this, and I, it does fit with the idea that this is foreshadowing for John. Now, um, there are people who have said that there is, George R. R. Martin has written a, another book set in a different universe about an ice dragons, and that thought is clearly there. There's certainly lots of thoughts of constellations of ice dragons and rumours of them and all the rest of it. Um, so uh, he's clearly got this idea out there. I think that, that the other thing that that is foreshadowing is not just John, but there's also what is going to happen with one of the three dragons, which we saw on the show uh, when uh, we have Viserion 
uh, effectively becomes an ice dragon. We had a huge amount of uh, fun, nerdy discussion about whether he was an, a, a white dragon or a white walker dragon or anything like that. But just as a concept, he was an ice dragon. So that was uh, uh, that's that uh, probably won't happen exactly the same way. Uh, well, definitely won't happen exactly the same way because that if you missed it, that entire episode, the Beyond the Wall episode, the showrunners wrote that. Uh, it wasn't that and they made that bit up. It's, that's not a thing that George R. R. Martin told them happened. This was a, uh, them wanting to do. There are echoes, I'm sure, of what George R. R. Martin is, is wanting. But either the others or Euron will get hold of a dragon. Of that, I'm absolutely sure. And that dragon will then figuratively become an ice dragon. So that is, uh, that is I think, what is going on there. As for... Uh, whether that could be or what could be uh, in the section of the crypts that is cut off, um, that sort of goes into a couple of uh, questions I've got. So Ariel Winchester says, a big curiosity of mine is what lies at the bottom or end of the crypts. Do you think there's dragon eggs, the key to stopping the others and so on? Um uh, and Lady Pushkin says, do you think that the secret to stopping the others lies in the crypts? Well, uh, I will talk, first of all, I think, about the uh, the section of the crypts which has uh, been, um, which is inaccessible. So uh, the, the context here is that the crypts uh, are huge. They are larger than um, many, many castles. Um, they are ginormous. They are many layered. Uh, they've got huge high ceilings. Um, they uh, And they start from the bottom and work up. So by what I mean is that we know all the Stark dead are buried there. The oldest were at the very bottom and the, the most recent are at the top level. So um almost all of the crypts seem to be in pretty good condition we don't hear yes they're thousands of years old but we don't hear about bits of falling masonry or anything like that except for the very last bit where there appears to have been some sort of cave in or something that something that is preventing people from getting to where the very oldest starks should be buried so this is a bit of a mystery because clearly the, the the crypts are important and they're they're magical and clearly they were created at the time of the earlier Starks at the time of Bran Stark but we can't get in there to see what the what's at the very end of this or what, what's at the very beginning. Even. Um, now my take, which I will talk about a lot more in a moment, is that the reason why the Starks are all there is because they, they are an army, an army of the dead, which can be raised and they can be taken to fight the others. I think this is why the whole thing was set up. Um, and uh, it is just creating this bank as you go through time, it gets added to and added to and added to the dead Starks as a dead Stark army. Now, wh why would that fit in with the idea of there being a, a, a bit where the very earliest Starks, we can't get at them? My answer to that is that actually, we hear that the others did come again certainly on the timelines that we're we're told about the 13th lord commander was the knight's king and he seems to have uh, been sacrificing to the others he seems to uh, his the knight's queen seems a very othery kind of figure and in response to this the starks and the the wildlings the the, the free folk beyond the wall joined forces and took on the, this threat and defeated it. Now, we're told that um, there is 
the Horn of Winter was blown. Now, the Horn of Winter is this legendary thing. I'll talk again. I'll talk about this a bit more. But clearly, there seems to be a link across to the, the kings of winter, which is what the Starks were called for, for millennia. Now, when that was blown, forget all these kind of stories about it. This will bring down the wall. It was blown and the wall did not come down. So it does not do that. However, we are told on, I think, eight separate occasions that it raises giants from the earth. Now, this, for me, is the hint of what it does. So if you've got all of these stark dead, stark dead army waiting to be summoned, they have to be summoned by something. What, what is that something? The thing that makes the most sense is the horn that wakes the sleepers, the, the horn of winter. 13 Lord Commander of the Night's Watch in the horn was blown. What would have happened to the first 13 or so generations of Starks buried in the crypts? They would have risen and come out and fought. So I think that this kind of makes sense that uh, what happened then was that they those that bit of crypts was then emptied and so they had to start again so they just shut down that bit and then started building the army up again thinking well the others will return at some point so for me that is what is down at the bottom it is not something that they've got they're guarding down there it's simply where the uh the first starks were and the first starks rose and fought against the others, and they served their purpose, so they then have started again. That's, for me, that is the most sensible suggestion as to what's going on. Um, uh, Hog Boblin, great name, thank you so much for the super chat, says, why do you think that the Stark dead are unique? If the crypts and Winterfell are meant as a bulwark against the others, why not other families with God's Woods and a ton of ancestors? Uh, very good question. Am I, I mean, I don't have a, sh a short answer to this one, um, other than to say that I think that this was sealed by magic and that the, the, the Starks would be the kings of winter in exchange for them being there to um, uh, protect the North forever. Now, the, there is clearly some link across between the Starks, in my view, between the Starks and the, uh, the others. Now, why I say that is because the, the, there are rumours, legends, that the Night's King was a Stark. So immediately you get this uh, link across there. The the magic of on the show, this is the magic of the Night King appears to be very much like the magic of, say, Bran Stark, but in reverse. Bran can go into living people and animals and can take control of them and make them do what he wants. The Night King can do that to the dead uh, and so on. So it it appears if if the show was roughly right that this was taking a, a human uh doing some spell on them this is the origin of the others doing some spell on them to turn them into this creature which can then attack the humans um what if that first one was a stark it makes sense to me if this is some uh, way of paying off some debt for the Starks. As I say, I, there's there's uh, there, there's no sort of text for saying that this is exactly what it is, but there's sort of layers of of hints and 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 what happened on the show, and also that there is an echo here of the dead men of Dunharrow, which was in the Lord of the Rings. We know that the that George R. Martin is a massive fan of Lord of the Rings. The dead men of Dunharrow were not just this sort of ghostly army that suddenly decided to fight for Aragorn. They had a long debt to pay 
they had to defend the, the, the dead men of Dunharrow failed to come to the aid of Minas Tirith uh, centuries earlier, and they were waiting until the rightful heir to Minas Tirith, Aragorn, came and said, now you can pay off your debt. So if what's going to happen in the Winterfell Crypts is some kind of homage to the dead men of Dunharrow, it's not just going to be a, oh, there's some dead people, because that's not really an homage to the dead men of Dunharrow. What it would be would be, here is a, a long de a debt that has to be repaid, some sealed in by magic, uh, which is what we probably what we saw happening with the Weirwood Tree all that time ago. So that, for me, is what, what's going on there. I think that there is some uh, ancient reason why the Starks are there. Other uh, um, families, incidentally, do bury their dead, uh, the Boltons, in the same way the Boltons do in their crypts, uh, for example. But yes, the Starks, I think, uh, are special because of their links across uh, to the others. Uh, Dominic Vaughan, thank you so much, saying, what's the relevance of Liana's bones being there? Uh, John's arc. I will come on to that one. If that's okay, uh, Dominic, I've got a question on this um, in just a little bit. So I'll wrap up my answer to that um, with this one when I get to it in a moment. Uh, but the sort of the short answer is that um, all, or the short contextual answer is that all Starks, are buried there in the crypts. It's it's a fallacy. This idea that um, uh, only the the lords of Winterfell or the kings of Winter are buried there. They're the ones who get the statues, but all the Starks are buried there. So for her bones to have gone back up and be buried there is not um, significant. That is an entirely reasonable and rational thing for Ned Stark to do, but. The significant thing is the fact that she's got a statue, not her bones being there. Um, and I'll get on to the statue in a little bit. Um, Ariel Winchester, thank you so much uh, for the super sticker. Um, that's, uh, that's really kind. Um, and uh, Hog Bobbin, thank you. I'm, I'm glad the, the answer was uh, was helpful for you. Okay, let's go to um, Howland's little sister, who has a question over on Patreon, which says, I think the crypt beneath Winterfell will be a place of new secrets that will be shared as the end of the story is told in the books. I do think that the long dead members of the Stark clan will rise and do something, what do you want them to do, Robert, if it were your story to tell? So I, I think, I mean, I've sort of expanded on this a, a bit, but what I want is for this to be an, an army that is thousands of years in the creation, that is the result of some uh, long, long lost obligation, a long, uh, long um, lost piece of magic with the children of the forest connected with the creation of the others in the first place and the starks will rise this is how i'd like it to be the starks will rise to fulfill their obligation to be defending uh, the people against the others that is where i would like this to be going it's um i think it would it would look really cool and i think that all of the, um, apologies for the sound, that's uh, my dog Dan just shaking himself. Um, all of the imagery we have in the crypts is of the uh, there being life there. The, I looked through that first chapter, the first Ned chapter when he goes down to the crypts with Robert Baratheon, and I think it was something like seven or eight times there were anthropomorphic references to the statues. They, the statues were watching them, the statues were judging Ned, the statues uh, were sort of moving in the shadows and things like that. Um, George R. R. Martin was dropping so many hints that made them seem human, 
that for me it is they have to come alive at some point this is this is what he has foreshadowed and and not only then but he when um Theon goes down there, books later, Theon goes down there, exactly the same thing happens. They're looking down at him and all the rest of it. They are, George R. R. Martin wants us to think of those statues as humans, uh, as spirits, uh, not just as sort of like memorials to dead Starks. So for me, they they do have to come back. Um, and, and all the, sorry, Going off on one here, but the 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 symbolism we have about the the swords and all the rest of it, which I will come onto in detail later, is about trapping their spirits in the crypts. Um, uh, uh, so everything ties into this idea that the the spirits of the dead Starks have been kept there until they are needed for something. Um, uh, Marty Dodger, thank you so much for the super chat, saying thank you so much for all you do. You're very welcome. I love this channel so much. I am so psyched that you're covering the crypts. By far my favourite of the Game of Thrones theory playgrounds. Yeah, I love it. I have to say, it's um, there's there's so so many different elements to this. It has taken me a long time to get to the point that I am now, where I feel I understand what is the most likely scenario for what's happening there. And even now, I think to myself. Well, you know what? If we get more evidence about something else that's going on, one of the other theories could be right. Uh, but George R. R. Martin is focusing on this so much. Something, something big has to happen here, uh, and it won't just be a, like on the show, people hiding in the crypts. It's going to be a lot bigger than that because he flagged it up right from the very start, right from Ned's first chapter. We have. Um, we have King Robert looking at Lyanna as if willing her to come back to life. Uh, th this is so much uh, of the language is about these statues being alive that I find it, it impossible that, that there isn't going to be uh, much going on there. Oh, Hacks Dogma's in the chat. Hi there, Hacks. Um, so uh, I... I will cover this more in just one moment. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm a massive Westworld fan. Westworld season three is starting this Sunday uh, and I will be giving it full coverage and on my, I'm going to be doing live streams on Sunday as well as Thursday all the way through the season. So my Sunday live streams at the same time, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, they will be just Westworld. There'll be pre-shows for the, the episode of Westworld coming up. Um, Hacks Dogma has got a fantastic channel that covers, among other things, Westworld he does brilliant Westworld videos. In fact, I, I think he released a 40 minute, 40 minute epic catch up on seasons one and two uh, video just in the last day or so. Hacks will be joining me certainly for the first of the uh, uh, the pre show live streams and for as many as we can both uh, be on after that because he's uh, he's excellent. So I highly recommend you go and check out Hacks Dogma if you have not done so already. Uh, but I will talk a little bit more, more about what I'm doing on Westworld uh, in a moment. Let's go to, uh, I've got another question on a similar issue from Casey of House Lawbridge. It seems to me that the idea of the dead of the Winterfell crypts rising like the dead men of Dunharrow that I was talking about earlier is too optimistic for George R. R. Martin's story. Do you think the dead will rise at all? And if so, will they possibly be more menacing like they were in season eight? Um, I, I don't think it's too optimistic. I think that this will actually be quite scary. Now, my uh, take on this has moved away. Um, I did a video on this quite recently. It's moved away from the idea of them being ghosts and to more towards them being the actual statues rising like giants from the earth, as we're told. So I think that will be not a... Uh, an optimistic, happy moment. I think this is going to be an incredibly scary moment because th the North remembers. No, the North does not remember. The North has absolutely no idea what's going on. Somebody's going to blow the horn of winter and suddenly all these massive statues, because they do seem to be massive, we're always told that they're looking down on people. These massive statues come to life. Uh, this is going to, and this will be, I'm sure, as as the army of the others is coming towards Winterfell, 
this is not going to be some wonderful uh, moment. This is going to be uh, of sweetness and happiness in life. This is going to a sort of uh, border on uh, horror because the way the show liked to play this was this was the army of the dead against the army of the living. That is nowhere near where the books are going. Yes, we've got the army of the dead, but who's in the army of the living? Well, it's probably going to be led by John, who himself was dead. Who else do we know is is was dead? We well, we had Beric. We've got Lady Stoneheart going on. If we get these dead Starks rising, it's not this clean cut goodies versus baddies, living versus dead kind of thing. This is very much a more, more complicated, and more nuanced. A fight of of two different forces, and we have we will have to start thinking to ourselves, well, who's who's in the right here? I think we will understand a little bit more about the others and their motivations, and actually start to think, well, they've got a point. We might not agree with them, but we will probably think that they've got a point. So, I don't think that this is going to be a happy, optimistic note. I think this is going to be quite a dark, horrific note of these massive uh, creatures emerging from the crypts uh, to fight against uh, the dead. Um, it's going to be astonishing. Um, da, 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 having a quick flick through. Um, let's do a couple more questions before I take a moment just to, to let you know stuff that's coming up on this channel. Donald Peoples saying, if the statues are going to be the ones to rise to fight the others, are the Stark dead protected from the magic of the others, or will we see something like what happened in the show? Um, okay, so on the show, if you remember, what happened in the crypts was the obvious thing that when uh, the Night King sort of raised his hands and all the dead were raised, then the dead Starks also were raised. I think that what the magic of the Winterfell crypts does is it binds the spirits of the Starks to their statues, or the Stark kings to their statues, and therefore prevents them uh, from being under the spell of the others. I think that the other Stark dead down there probably will be protected by there are lots of bits of sort of symbolism that are very similar between Blood Raven's cave beneath the weirwood tree and the crypts at Winterfell beneath the wind, the, wind, uh, the weirwood tree. I think that they will be protected in the same way that the Blood Raven's cave was protected on the show. So I think that we're going to get, um, we're not going to see um, the Stark dead. I think it would make for, <laughs> And an astonishing, if I'm talking about slightly more macabre, uh, horrific um, uh, battle going on to have the, the the statues rising to fight for the humans, and then the, the bodies of all of the Starks who weren't kings rising as whites and fighting them. That would be that would be. <laughs> ridiculous and complicated but i can't believe that the magic that was instigated all that time ago given that they knew what the powers of the others were to raise the dead i can't believe that they wouldn't have put some protections around all of the the dead who are there so i i think that that's that's likely we haven't uh got anything other than the fact that george martin hasn't hinted at this really um when you go down into the crypts a lot of the fallacy about only the Stark kings and lords of Winterfell are buried there comes from the fact that we don't actually hear much about the other uh, Stark dead who are buried down there. We we have to just pick out bits of information from um, Arya and Bran, you know, playing around the the crypts, of the where they were going to be buried and things like that, um, to tell us that yes, other Starks are buried down there. Uh, but George R. R. Martin doesn't major on it. And because he hasn't majored on it, it does seem to suggest that that's not going to be a major plot point. Um, Kraken Tacos says, there are two crypts that don't have a sword to keep the dead in place. Will this be a factor in the winds of winter? 
Um, okay, so the the background to this is that the sword and and Ned thinks about this, and several other people think about this. So again, this is something George R. R. Martin is flagging up: is that the sword laid across the lap of all of those statues is supposed to keep their spirit uh, there in the Winterfell crypts. Now, uh, Ned absentmindedly one wonders when he sees a statue without one, uh, whether that means that the spirit is now free to roam around Winterfell above ground. Uh, he hopes not. Uh, so clearly that's, well, that, that is the background to it. But clearly there's an issue here because the question you say, there are two statues that don't have a sword. I think that's a reference to uh, Brandon Stark and Rickard Stark. When Bran and co left the crypts, they took with them a couple of swords, Brandon Stark's and Rickard Stark's swords to help them in their journey. There was also a third one that they took, Hodor appeared from, they do not, do not know where, with a rusty old iron sword he picked up from some statue. So there are three there, but Ned specifically thinks that, you know, if you head down further, going back hundreds, thousands of years, then the swords there have rusted away. The statue is still there, but the sword itself has just rusted away over time. So the we don't have a number for it, but there, uh, there are certainly lots of statues that do not have that sword. So it's a question of how seriously do we take this idea that the sword is needed to keep the, the spirit in there? I mean, we don't know is the short answer. Uh, it makes sense to me that if this is magical, that and we take it at that the word, then the oldest Starks won't, rise it's just going to be the most recent ones less brandon and rickard um but um again this does seem to be the kind of thing that you would have thought that they would have thought about when they were setting up the magic for this kind of place and given how big they made the crypts they clearly were ready to be waiting for thousands of years uh, and they must have known that those swords would not last a thousand years so uh yeah this is one of those ones that we can say we do not know. We know what the the legends say. It means that they won't rise. But practically, I think they probably will still. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, whether it's a factor in the winds of winter, I don't think we're going to see this happen until a dream of spring, I should say. I think that the winds of winter will end with the others coming south of the wall. And so a dream of spring will have the battle at Winterfell quite early on. Um, okay, let's take a a moment to, as I always do halfway through these streams, just to say what's coming up in this channel. I already mentioned it a little bit, but I'll, I'll say again. Westworld is starting this Sunday. If you're not into Westworld, I highly recommend you do try and get, get into it. I think this is probably a good place to, to start it again um, uh, or to start for the first time if you don't want to go back through seasons one and two. But seasons one and two are excellent. I've just rewatched them myself, so I'd highly recommend it. Anyway, I'm going to be doing uh, Westworld big time. I'm going to be doing a pre-show live stream uh, with a couple of guests on each week. Hacks Dogma, who I've already mentioned, uh, will be there as, as often as we can get him on. Um, and uh, that's going to be at t uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Sunday. On the Monday, within 24 hours of the episode airing, I will get my episode breakdown up. I'm also going to do uh, trailer breakdowns and, if I can, another video every week. That uh, is gonna, clearly going to take some time, but I am going to carry on with both this Thursday live stream, focusing in on A Song of Ice and Fire, maybe a couple of Lord of the Rings live streams, um, but also uh, I will be carrying on with the Lord of the Ring and the songs, Lord of the Rings and A Song of Ice and Fire videos uh, at least one a week, all the way through Westworld season three. So uh, if you enjoy them, do not worry, the content will keep on coming. Um, the my second channel, if you're interested in that, I think Maura mentioned it earlier, uh, the Well Told Tale. That's my 
audio narration channel. I just read uh, what I consider to be the finest fantasy and science fiction stories ever written. Uh, we've just started a new story, which is Alice in Wonderland, uh, which is fantastic. I'm sure you've seen a film or, or, or two in your time. Uh, if you've never read the book and you're interested in what the original is like, and it is wonderful, fantastic story, uh, then do go and check out my second channel, The Well Told Tale. The other thing I always do is to thank my patrons. Patrons, I genuinely can't do what I do without your support, so thank you so much. Um, if you're interested in being a patron, uh, supporting the channel, or getting access to some stuff I do just for my patrons, like uh, priority questions here on live streams, I do uh, some uh, content just for my patrons, things like that, uh, then there's a link down in the description if you're at all interested in that. Uh, so that's what's coming up over the next few weeks. Um, two live streams a week from now on, the Sunday one just on Westworld, the Thursday one will be, uh, as usual, about A Song of Ice and Fire and Lord of the Rings. Uh, Jackie um, Miner, thank you so much for the super chat, saying, uh, will the statues be uh, as soulless as the whites, or will they be more reminiscent of the people they were built to represent? Is Liana's statue included? Um, well, the second part with Liana's statue, uh, I've got a couple of questions from my patrons, so I'll answer that bit with them. Um, but I think there is a reason why she's got a statue. And I think that there's a reason uh, for the statues all being there. And I think that the logic of that is that, yes, she is going to be among the statues. The first part, are they going to be as soulless as the whites or reminiscent of uh, the, the people they're supposed to represent? What we're sort of shown is that the, the spirits of the dead Starks are still there. They're there when um, Ned goes down there, he feels them there judging him. John, when he has a dream about them, he feels that they're saying, you know, you do not belong here to, to him. Theon thinks about them. So we're always told that these are the spirits of the, the dead Starks are there. And we've got their likenesses. So I think that what we're going to see is that they, effectively, the spirit of one of the dead king is captured within that statue, and that will be marching to war. That, I think, is what we get. They're not just soulless, mindless things, uh, sort of stone golems. That's not what they are. They are actually the Stark kings, but with these stone, giant stone bodies. So that seems to be what uh, what is being hinted at here. Um, Dominic Vaughan says, uh, there's reference to the swords of the Starks of the past as a barrier to the dead returning. Um, also allied to this, but not a, but a long shot, do you think these will either be Valyrian steel or contain dragon glass and can be used in the fight against the others? So th this I think is a really interesting Point. I think I've covered off the first half of that one already about the swords. The, the question is, how are they actually going to hurt the others or the whites? How is that going to actually happen? Because um, if they were built for this purpose, then surely they will have been built with that in mind. Are the swords that they are given, Valyrian steel swords or dragonglass swords, no, I don't think so. Certainly, we, we're not told about that anywhere. So um, uh, I don't think that's what's going on. But I think that as they are magical creations, they will be able to inflict damage. Now, the one of the reasons why I started to move away from the idea of these being just ghosts and towards them being more physical creatures is the fact that when you get the dead men of Dunharrow in the Lord of the Rings, they win the battle, not through actually fighting anyone, but just by scaring them, by being this huge ghostly army. They charge towards the, the Corsairs that they were, they were up against, who 
ran away. They this they, they could not face an army of ghosts. That is not going to work against the others and against the whites. So uh, what would work is some sort of magical creature. Now, uh, we don't know in the books, we don't know huge amounts yet about what might kill the others. We know about dragon glass. There's uh, Valyrian steel. They made a quite big amount of that that in the on the show uh but maybe there's other things maybe maybe magical stone golems can punch and it is the magic within them that does this i i am not entirely sure um it would again it would make no sense for this plan which seems to be pretty clear that these stone statues are going to be defending the living if they could not actually inflict any damage. Uh, so there, there will be a way, and it's the fact that they are magical. The others and the whites are magical creatures, and, and the things which can hurt them are magical things. So the stone golems are magical things, so it, it seems likely to me that they will be able to hurt them, just not with the swords necessary that they would give them. Um, uh, Maester Mushroom, thank you for the uh, super chat. And Mushroom is a fantastic character. Um, uh, IDG, great chat. Love your explanation of theories. Who is your favourite character and how will George murder them? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I, I've said many times before, my favourite character is Tyrion. I love his point of it. doesn't mean I like him as a person, but, <laughs> but his... Um, uh, as a character, I really love uh, how he is. Um, I don't think he's going to die. I think I think he might lose his tongue. Complete digression on that one. Uh, I think I talked about that uh, a couple of weeks ago on a live stream. Uh, but I don't think he's going to die at the end of it. So um, uh, just to pick another one at random, though, Blood Raven. I love the character. I think he will die in a very similar way to how he died on the show. I think that. Um, the the others will manage to get into his cave and he will be killed off there and Bran will escape just in the nick of time. So I think that's uh, that's what's going to be happening with him. But Tyrion, no, I think Tyrion will survive. Um, uh, Dominic Vaughan, I see, uh, is having a in the chat talking about the others um, uh, being based on fairy folklore uh, with the kind of the she myths in Ireland. Um, yeah, so that the, uh, the way that they're presented in the books is almost beautiful, ethereal, um, different, a different sort of life. Now that is very much taking the imagery and the feel of the she and the fairy folk from sort of more Celtic mythology uh, that George R. Martin, I think, has definitely borrowed from. But that doesn't mean that he is using that in and of itself because the fairy folk were not created beings by children of the forest, for example. They, they, they just were. So um, he's taking the feel of them and a lot of the characteristics of them without taking everything about that myth. Uh, is my view. Um, let's uh, have a quick flick through, see if there. <laughs> Carl Karsnark saying, Robert is being a bit cryptic with his answers tonight. Uh, very good, very good. Um, Voice of Reason saying, maybe these undead of yours in the crypts will actually be rather ineffective against the others, and the living will have to find another way. George R. R. Martin likes to subvert Tolkien as much as he pay, pays homage. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was going to come around to this because having said a number of times that yes, of course they will they will be effective because this is a good plan. I ultimately I think they will lose. I agree. Uh, I think and and I think that that is a subverting of this dead men have done Harrow thing. Um, I think that that will add to the growing sense of how on earth are the others going to be defeated because the North has done everything it can. All of its best laid plans that have been there for thousands of years get smashed. The others keep on coming. Um, that is 
going to be a pretty horrific thing. Um, the main reason I think for that is is actually because I think the others will reach a lot further south. I think that the 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 heartbeat of the end of this story will be this area around the Isle of Faces, uh, Harren Hall, the inner the crossroads, particularly the Isle of the Faces. The amount of times we've had. Danny having dreams of uh, flying uh, in a dragon across the area. We've had uh, history books George R. R. Martin has done with dragons fighting each other above the God's Eye Lake. We've there, there is so much here that we've got the place of the pact in history where humans and children of the forest ended their conflict, uh, which has to have some connection in. Uh, the others. There's too much in here connected with that central area for that not to be important. And I think that it makes a huge amount of sense for uh, the the others to come all the way south as far as that. Um, uh, it will be horrific, but I think that that will be where the final denouement of the, uh, the others storyline happens. Uh, which means voice of reason. Yes, I agree. I think that the army of the the Stark um, dead uh, dead kings coming to life to, to protect the humanity it will be amazing. It will be impressive, but it will be ultimately futile. And I think that is George R. R. Martin just playing with all of our expectations. Uh, Stephen Rocket, thank you so much for the super chat, uh, saying this is all good speculation and seems likely to happen. But who will be the one to explain it? It can't just happen. It has to make sense within the story to avoid the deus ex machina trope. Yes. So uh, someone has to explain what's what's going on. Now, there are a few different ways that this could happen. But the most logical one is through Bran. Now, Bran has already gone back in time. He's seen what happened in Winterfell a long time ago, he will be able to access the Weirwood net. Uh, and if this is all part of the Children of the Forest and the Weirwood Net's attempts to create some kind of defensive structure, then he will be able to find it out through that. So he is the most logical place for that to happen. We'll get um, the, or the, the other logical place is it is through Sam in Old Town, which has got all of the ancient knowledge we've got going on there. Now, he has also got, and I'll get onto this in a bit more detail later, he has got the Horn of Winter, which he has been carrying around with him. We don't know for certain it's the Horn of Winter, but it must be the Horn of Winter that he's been carrying around with him. Uh, and he could well find out how to make it work. So I think that what we're going to find is that we've got him understanding how it might work. And then uh, we've got Bran uh, getting the understanding that it has to be blown in order to raise the, uh, the Stark dead. Um, and that's how it's all going to come together. The other person who might be able to help in this is Howland Reed. Howland Reed will appear at some point. George R. R. Martin has assured of this point, uh, and he has got huge amounts of knowledge. He spent a long time communing with the Weirwood Network on the Isle of Faces, so uh, he is in the know. So those are the places where we might find out about all of this. Um, the other possible place is, um, and I don't think it's likely we'll find out huge amounts of information, but we get Mance Raider will start the Winds of Winter, I'm pretty sure, in the Crypts of Winterfell. He um, will be exploring them. He will be trying to find things out. He is a very, very clever man. And I suspect that he will get some inklings about uh, uh, what is going on. He was hunting for the Horn of Winter for years north of the Wall. And he was hunting in the tombs of dead kings. And I think that he is clever enough to realize when he's down in the crypts of Winterfell, this is a tomb of dead kings. Uh, this is where there are giants uh, from deep buried under the earth. Uh, maybe I should be looking around here 
for something to do with the Horn of Winter. Um, maybe what the problem with the Horn of Winter was that it was broken, it was broken in two, and half of it was kept north of the wall, half of it was kept south of the wall in the Winterfell Crypts. So maybe that was what was going on. So there are lots of different ways that we could find out information about this. The most likely is, is a combination of all of these, but for Bran to be the person who understands the, the, the law behind it all. Um, uh, Donald Peoples, um, thank you again, uh, saying, so you're saying Bran won't just walk ravens and get awesome wheelchair designs. No, he's not going to, sorry. He will do those things, I feel absolutely sure. Uh, but, well, I don't know about the cool wheelchair designs, but he is going to have a much bigger role in this. He will be the manipulating person. They tried to show this on the show. Um, you can decide whether you think they were effective or not, that he was manipulating everything all the way through season eight, making sure everything landed the way he wanted it to land. So I think that that is what we're going to see increasingly from Bran, is that he is actually manipulating events in the way that Blood Raven was doing. He is going to be taking on that role because he is then sucked up within the Weirwood network, effectively. He, Bran, the boy, will no longer be there. There will be elements of him, but he will be the Weirwood Network. Um, but he will definitely be walking into Raven still. Do not worry about that. Um, um, Bran is going to do everything, says Shannon T. Yep, I think, um, I think, well, I don't know if they'll do everything, but he will do a huge amount. Um, so uh, Fred Versteeg saying the broken horn half north and half south of the wall wasn't your first theory about what broken meant. When did you change your idea about the meaning of broken? Um, well, I can't remember what, what my first theory of what broken is, but I, this does, and I think we're going to move on to um, uh, the, the Horn of Winter in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, but the, the horn that we're talking about here they find north of the wall, it's in this cache of dragon glass and this horn, uh, and they try and blow it. And the word that's used is that it didn't work because it was broken. But it doesn't seem to actually, it seems to be still in work, working order. But what, what could be broken about a horn? Uh, it's always been slightly intriguing. Uh, I, where I probably started out was thinking this is magically broken had to be um, made to work with some sort of magic spell. Now I come to this idea that uh, the, the Lord of Winterfell, the King of Winter, at the time when the we know that the Horn of Winter last worked was a guy called Bran the Breaker. Now I think, yes, he could have broken many things. He could have broken his word. He could have broken... Um, uh, the, the backs of his enemies. He could have done any of these things, but given the fact that we have a horn that was working and then later it, we're told was broken, that is connected to him, it makes sense to me that perhaps he broke it deliberately because he saw the power of the horn in action and he thought, I don't want this just being used randomly to raise the Starks. It has to only be used uh, at the time of greatest need. Now, I am coming to around, and this, again, I've not got huge amounts other than this idea that it makes sense for Mance Raider to find part of the horn in the crypts of Winterfell. That perhaps the horn was broken in two. Perhaps it was broken in the same way that the, the Night's King was defeated by a coalition of those north of the wall and south of the wall perhaps the horn should be kept part north of the wall, part south of the wall. So part of it was north of the wall. That was the part that, fat, that, that Sam and Ghost and John found north of the wall. Perhaps that had been held in Blood Raven's cave, uh, because it seems that Blood Raven probably was the person who placed that cache of dragon glass and the horn where it was. Um, and perhaps the other half of this was hidden somewhere down in the crypts of Winterfell. 
So perhaps we're going to uh, have the horn uh, unbroken, put back together again, um, and then uh, used. So that's uh, that's where I've come to with this. Uh, the, the idea that it's broken, um, magically broken, I think it has to have been magically broken, but I think it, perhaps in the same way that I moved from this being a, a ghostly kind of magical uh, resurrection of the, the Starks to a more physical one, I'm now wondering whether the breaking of the Horn of Winter was a more physical one. Um, uh, okay, so, yeah, and uh, Silja Tanner, lots of people, uh, I, the Horn needs a read. Uh, is is something a lot of people do so do um, uh, suggest. It certainly would make sense of the name, um, although um, my take is that it will be John who blows it rather than the the reeds. Uh, Alicia Kingston saying, "I feel like the Broken Horn of Winter is similar to the Shards of Narsil." Yep, I, I, that's again that's a sort of a good uh, link across there. Um, Andrew K saying. Uh, couldn't Brand and the Break have also been the one to break or collapse the old portion of the crypts as well? Yeah, I think he definitely was the person who did that. Um, uh, so he would have broken down part of the crypts to, to keep that bit hidden. Um, uh, Patrick, James saying, what's John's role with being involved with the crypts? I will get on to him in just one moment. Um, uh, Tony3483 saying, have you talked about the dragon eggs in the crypts yet? We haven't. Um, I did. So the, there was a rumour that so, and I forget off the top of my head which uh, dragon it was, came up to Winterfell um, and uh, the rumour was that uh, they laid eggs in the Winterfell crypts now. This would be connected with the hot springs. This is perhaps a place where the dragons would want to have their um, their eggs in the same way that they do on Dragonstone. Uh, was that just a rumour? Was it true? We don't know is the honest answer. Um, they certainly haven't ever been found. Uh, and I don't think that they're going to hatch in this story. So to a certain degree, I, I don't think that this is going to be central. I think that this is another one of those things where we're encouraged to think about a dragon at Winterfell as a foreshadowing of John. So I think that that is the main purpose of what that is. Might someone find them late at some point? Possibly. Uh, but I don't think that they're going to be central at all, the story going forward. I don't think that we're going to have, have them hatched and join uh, the fight with lots of uh, new dragons. Um, okay, let's get to some more questions from my patrons. Well, I'll, uh, let's do the Horn of Winter ones, as we've been talking about it. Maura Lee was saying, could you recap where the Horn of Winter currently is and how it will get back to Winterfell and who will be the person to blow it? Um, okay, so the if we're working on the assumption that the Horn of Winter is that horn that um, was discovered in the cache north of the wall, which I think is a pretty fair assumption. It's with Sam. Now, Sam took it with him from the wall when he went on his journey uh, to Old Town. Now, one of the reasons why we get the impression that this horn might be um, quite significant is that they didn't just have a straightforward journey to get down there in the books. Uh, they set sail and went across first to, to Bravos to take on provisions and head on down south towards Old Town. When they're in Bravos, um, uh, basically the the one of the Night's Watchmen abandoned them, uh, and Sam, in order to charter a boat to get them to where they needed to go, he had to sell pretty much everything he owned. Literally, he had the clothes he had left, he was wearing, and the horn. That, and we're, we're specifically told that. So we're reminded that he had it when he left, we're reminded that he had it then, and he kept hold of it when he got rid of everything else, and then also when he gets there. 
So we're, we're being reminded that this horn is here, this is important. So it is with him. I think that he will head north. Uh, the old town is going to burn. Uh, the, uh, the symbolism of the, the great library of Alexandria and uh, the great library and uh, the, uh, the citadel is too much, I think, to, um, uh, for George R. R. Martin to resist. I think that it will burn. I think that that will be the, um, the ironborn who will do that. Now, um, Sam will head up north, I think, from this variety of places that I've been talking about. Uh, I think that, that our heroes will work out that it, the horn needs to be repaired and then it needs to be blown. The question is, who is going to blow this horn? Who, who might be the right person to do it? Now, uh, I covered this in the video, but I think I was trying to work through in my head who, who might be the candidates that they would, if this is a magical thing, then uh, who might, when the magic was set up, who they might, they say, is the person who can blow it? Because probably not anyone. Um, perhaps it's the current Lord of Winterfell. That would make sense, wouldn't it? If, if anyone has got the right to raise the, uh, the Stark the former Lords of Winterfell, it is the current Lord of Winterfell. So maybe it's the current Lord of Winterfell. But then if you go back in history, you find that the person allegedly who blew it the first time was Joraman, the king beyond the wall. So perhaps it needs to be blown by whoever the wildlings recognise as their leader. Um, but then also this is clearly connected in with the Night's Watch as being a... Um, a key part of the defences against the others, so perhaps it should be the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch who is the person with the authority to do this. Or perhaps, if we're going even more meta, perhaps it is Azora High Reborn or the Prince that was promised or any of these other things. And then when I was working my way through this, I realised actually one person could be all of those things, and that's John. John could well be the Lord of Winterfell at that point, because uh, Rob, we think, legitimised John before he died and said that he's the new Lord of Winterfell. Um, and uh, he could be the one that the wildlings follow. They've already, in the books, they're already um, seeing him as a leader uh, and we certainly saw on the show that by the end of it, he was the one who was leading them back out again. So they see him as a leader. He is the Lord Commander. Really, he was just killed, but he is the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Uh, who's going to take over from him? Well, maybe he, he just retains the title. Um, and obviously, he's got huge amounts of um, uh, Prince that was promised imagery about him. So the person who fits all of these possibles is John. So I think it is John who is the most likely person to blow the horn. Um, then, uh, Maura, you also asked, if the horn can raise the dead in the crypts, will Ned and Lyanna be two of the dead that we get to see fight for Winterfell and um, for the Starks? Um, so, uh, oh, actually, just before that, really good question. Andrew Kay is just saying, uh, is there no cost in blowing it? Perhaps Joraman died blowing it the first time round. It could kill whoever blows, uh, blows it. Um, this would certainly fit with Dragonbinder, which is this other horn that we uh, hear about down uh, that Euron has. Whoever blows that seems to die. Uh, so, yep. Yeah, Possibly, and John perhaps could die and then get brought back again because it's happened to him already. Uh, Girl Nettles says uh, Daenerys fits all of those too. Uh, Daenerys doesn't, to my mind, fit being the Lord of Winterfell. I suppose you could argue that she would say that she's the a natural uh, queen of the Seven Kingdoms. John could claim he's the king of the Seven Kingdoms nat um, naturally. Uh, she's not the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch and she's not the person the Wildlings follow. Uh, so yes, she fits some of those, but I think that it fits John more neatly. And Defence of the North is John's thing, um, uh, symbolically. And uh, e even if you take Daenerys as being 
uh, you know, the central Azora High kind of character in this, uh, then John definitely has the role in protecting the North and having the Starkey things going on there. So, um, yeah, I think he seems more likely uh, to me, at least. Uh, so uh, getting back to this question from uh, Morley about will Ned and Liana be two of the dead that we see? Now, this also, there was a question, I, I've forgotten who it was earlier, sorry, in the super chat was asking about Liana uh, and her statue. Now, um, Ned, I think probably not. His bones are working their way north, um, but certainly Barbary Dustin does not want to let them get to Winterfell crypts. And I think the fact that there has been so much focus on her in the story seems to imply that she will have a role. So I suspect that Ned probably won't. Uh, Liana, though, is a different matter. Liana does have a statue there. And we're not told explicitly that she has a sword across her lap, but we are told that hers was not one of the swords that was taken. So whereas Rickard and Brandon's swords were both taken, leaving this element of doubt that perhaps she wasn't going to, or perhaps that they won't rise, uh, we don't have that element of doubt with her. Uh, so I think, yes, there's a fair chance that she could rise. And so perhaps this is, and, and this is a, again, slightly mind-blowing possibility, but perhaps this is how John meets his mother in a way it won't be exactly her it'll be her spirit trapped in uh in a statue but it would be her uh, because she has her bones were taken up there by ned um uh, philip of house harris saying any chance a horn could have an effect on azora high but possibly um i think my my take is that the Horn, if we're trying to think about what um, what the Horn of Winter itself symbolically should be doing, um, then it's something to do with winter. Link across to the Kings of Winter are there, uh, and Winterfell, of course. Part of the Night's Watch vow is saying that they are the Horn that wakes the sleepers, uh, so uh, that does seem to be implying what uh, the, the role there is to, to wake the sleepers, not to have an effect on Zora High. Um, could it have an effect? Well, yes, but we've not. There's no legends or hints or rumours of this uh, in any way. We're told basically two things about what the Horn of Winter does. One, it brings down the wall. Two, it raises dragons, and uh, not dragons, it raises giants from the earth. Um, uh, the evidence is that it doesn't bring down the wall, uh, but we're told eight times about it raising giants from the earth. So I think that there's a very good chance that it does something along those lines. Um, as for Azora High Reborn, we have no evidence that it, it I mean it might, but uh, I think we've, we know a thing that, that it does do. Um, uh, so I don't think we need to sort of expand that out much more. Um, let's flick up to, um, as we're talking about Liana, Megasandra is asking, what are your thoughts on Liana and Brandon being in the crypt? As I believe only uh, Stark kings are typically the ones placed there. And Leaf Underhill um, uh, asks about, um, uh, da -da -da, linked with this, seems like Ned didn't know what was going on or why the, the statues were there, but Liana did, or from Rhaegar's research perhaps, or her own research, and she wanted to join the fight. Must be awfully strong magic if it keeps working when none of the people involved in the burials know about it. So um, this is, I, I think, both of these great, great questions around Liana, and this is something that I have, I mean, I can put a tinfoil hat on here because there's no evidence for this, but I just like it as an idea um, that uh, Liana made Ned promise her several things. It wasn't just one promise, there's several things. Uh, and Ned said, 
uh, that one of them effectively or implied that one of them was to take her bones up north. Now, so this, the, the question is, why did he create the Leanna and Brandon statues? This is one of those things which sort of nags at the back of my brain, perhaps your brain as well. It's that we kind of go, yeah, okay, so the, the standard answer is because he loved them both so much that he wanted to honour them with statues. And that kind of makes sense, you go, but, you know, this is thousands of years of, uh, of tradition that he's going against. Yes, there, there, there is at least one example of a, a non, um, non-Lord of Winterfell who has a statue down there, but Ned will have known he's going against huge amounts of tradition there and yes ned was probably we think of him as being this sort of great um embodiment of the north but he was probably the least north northerny uh lord of winterfell ever he was raised for a large part of his youth south of south uh, of of the neck in in the eerie uh, he happily created a sept for Cat and seems to have been happy to allow his children to be educated in the faith of the Seven as well as the, the faith of the old gods. So he doesn't appear to be as much of a traditionalist as we might think, but at the same time, it does seem a little bit odd to be doing those two statues. And it's the kind of thing that sort of nags, but you haven't really got any reason for it. And to go back to when I was saying about like this tinfoil hat, I don't have... I don't have any evidence for this, but uh, as Leif Underhill was saying, what if Lyanna actually made him promise to make her a statue of her? Now, that would make sense of why she's got a statue. Um, the, the one of Brandon would be to sort of perhaps hide this in a way because it makes, um, you know, uh, it makes it just appear this is what a thing that Ned did. He loved his brother and sister so much. Uh, it's not just her. Um, so perhaps that's what happened. I don't know. We don't have the evidence for it. Um, we do know that Rhaegar did do huge amounts of research into um, uh, things like the prince that was promised, and perhaps he did come across some link across to the Winterfell crypts. I don't know. It seems slightly unlikely, but again possible. Um, so uh, Megasandra asking the bigger question, your thoughts on Leanna Le Le and Brandon being there, I think from a plot perspe perspective, I think it is so that Leanna is, um, it, it helps in the first chapter, Ned chapter, when uh, they've actually got something to address the the sort of the conversation about and Ned can be imagining her statue and all the rest of it when later on. Um, uh, and I think it also potentially sets up the, what I was talking about earlier, this idea that her statue could come to life and then actually come face to face with John and that would be pretty amazing. I think Brandon is just a... Um, if he was going to put one up for Leanna, then he had to really put one up for Brandon as well. Although we don't have uh, huge amounts of him, that you could put an argument that maybe he was for a very short period of time, uh, technically the Lord of Winterfell, if he if his father died just before him, we, we don't know that bit for absolutely sure. Um, uh, Alicia Kingston saying maybe it isn't just Stark kings and lords. What if it's honoured Stark warriors? Thus, Lyanna would have always been meant to have a statue there. Yeah, so honoured warriors um, get to go in the lich yard above ground. Starks as a whole, uh, it does seem to be, and you know, Bran mentions that this was going against tradition. All the rest of it does just seem to be the lords uh, of of Winterfell, the Kings of Winter. There was one example we're told about, like a great, great uncle who has a statue there as well, but that's it. It is just the Kings of Winter who are there uh, with their statues. Um, okay, let's go to 
Uh, I've got about three more questions now from my patrons. So uh, after that, I will uh, dip into the chat to be ans answering a few more there. Uh, Bryn Jones says, I very much admire your if in doubt blame Blood Raven theory. What is his interest, if any, in the crypts of Winterville? Yeah, so if in doubt blame Blood Raven. There's so got to be something to do with Blood Raven. Blood Raven here is hooked up to the Weirwood Network. He is part of this now, which means that he knows why the um the starks are buried there he knows all about this um and he has been uh, as well as preparing john for his role what he did almost it was almost certainly him was to bury the uh, the dragon glass and the horn of winter and get ghosts to discover them because he knew that the horn of winter would be needed so that's um, that's what his role is. He 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 knows what uh, Winterfell is there for. He knows what the, the the statues and the dead Starks are all there to be doing, and he knows what the Horn of Winter is there for. And he has has been nudging that back so that it gets back into circulation. Um, and for Sam to have it is great because Sam is the person most likely to figure out what's going on with it. Uh, John never really got it. He just thought, well, it's, it's an old horn and it's quite nice. But Sam seemed to get a sort of sentimental attachment to it. So, yes, this is um, very much uh, a matter of Blood Raven manipulating events as he usually does. Um, Chase says, my question is about the future of the crypts. If we go with the dead shall rise theory and the statues will fight the others, what do you think the aftermath of it all will be? Will the statues return to their places like nothing ever happened? Will the future head of the Starks keep the tradition alive just in case? Um, what do you think at the end of the series, Winterfell will be no more? So I think the, the most likely, as I said, the most likely situation is the Winterfell will be overrun uh, and people will have to escape it. I think that the statues will form a heroic defence, uh, allowing people to escape. I think that that will probably be their end role. Um, and uh, as for what happens to them, I think that they will be destroyed. I don't think we will find what happens going forward. If we do get Queen Sansa in the north, will she reinstate this idea of having the uh, using the, the crypts for the dead Starks, um, possibly. It's the kind of thing that uh, she is a, an, a complete political pragmatist. I, well, at, at the end in the on the show she was, and I suspect in the book she's going to get somewhere very similar as well. And the, the phrase, there must always be a Stark and Winterfell, I, I am personally sure was in order to try and ensure that the Starks would carry on adding to the stock of dead Starks down in the crypts. But as a as a political slogan, it's also incredibly useful. Why why are the, why are you Starks in charge of us? Well, there must always be a Stark in Winterfell. It's it's the it's the of course there has to be. Um, uh, and if not, what? Well, who knows? The North will fall. Um, that is a great political slogan. So it wouldn't surprise me if Sansa kept up the tradition, as many of the traditions, even if they are meaningless in the world going forward. Uh, I, she's the sort of person who would use that kind of thing. Um, uh, okay, we've got one uh, Death Shadow says Queen Sansa in the North. Blasphemy. No, I. I don't think so. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Queen Sansa in the North. Uh, it seems to, it seems to fit where her character arc goes. Um, that she wants desperately to escape from the North to go down south. She wants to be a queen in the South, uh, and then she grows, realizes she doesn't want that. Eventually gets back to the north because that is actually where she wants to be and where she needs to be and that is where her place when she starts out is always at you know at the mercy of others other people being controlling her life from the very beginning being told you know you're going to marry this person then down 
in King's Landing at the mercy of Cersei and Joffrey and everyone else. The end point for her, I think, is for her to be the only place that she can be where she is not beholden to anyone else, which is Queen being the top person. So that seems to me the most sensible character arc for her and, and ending point for her. Um, one uh, one more question from my patrons, then uh, I will uh, dip into the chat. Uh, so now is the time to drop any uh, final questions you've got uh, into the chat. Uh, Lady Pushkin uh, says or asks, how do you think Bran will fare in the south with no weirwood trees? Well, uh, good question. Uh, I think that there are weirwood trees in the south is the short answer. So clearly from Blood Raven's cave, he will head down to Winterfell where he's got a weirwood tree. Um, if you go through the north, there are more weirwood trees. When you actually get to sort of south of the neck, when you're in the Riverlands, you'll find actually there is a, a sort of a crescent, a semicircle of places where you will still find weirwood trees. So you find like uh, uh, old stones is is there. That's uh, and you get um, House Blackwood, Raven Tree Hall. Um, you come all the way around, ending up in the Isle of Faces. You get this kind of arc where the old gods certainly seems to still hold sway. So I think that he's not going to be lacking for weirwood trees, but I think that his powers will not be dependent on them as he gains in strength and power. As, uh, as Blood Raven said, you will be able to move beyond the weirwood trees. And I think that that is a hint that he was going to gain the power and strength to not, uh, not require them. As he did on the show, he, I mean, he, could yes, he could plug himself into the weirwood network by being by a weirwood tree, but he could still use his powers and talents not being connected to a weirwood tree. Um, okay, we've got uh, some questions in the chat. Um, Greet Weirwood so, saying, "I want to hear your opinion on raising stone direwolves and how Nymeria's pack would react to them." Uh, okay, so. When we're talking about the statues, all of the statues have a direwolf next to them, a stone direwolf. And they too seem to be described in ways of um, slightly as if they might come alive as well. That would be epic if they were. Um, uh, Nymeria's wolf pack is uh, currently in the Riverlands. It could make its way north. My best guess is that they're going to stay in the Riverlands and they will help out when the battle comes down south rather than making their way all the way up to the north. The, the north is, uh, and it's worth repeating this all the time because George R. Martin does care about practicalities, the north is snowed in, effectively. Um, you, you get at Winterfell, all but one of the gates are frozen shut. There's only one gate that works anymore. Um, the way that Theon escaped was jumping into the snow because it was piled up so high that he could jump off the top of an incredibly tall wall and get a soft landing because there was so much snow banked up. Um, this is, uh, you know, Stannis is camped out and they're eating horses and things like that. It's getting so terrible. The snow... Uh, the north is snowed in. People cannot move easily from one place to another. Um, so I don't think, even though, yes, dire wolves could get up, uh, even in the cold weather and all the rest of it, the dire wolves seem to be at the moment enacting revenge in the Riverlands, and I think that they will stay there until the action comes to them from the north, uh, if that makes sense. Um Uh, quickly flick through. Uh, Valkana and Nublet saying, if the horn raises the statues, what about the corpses? Will the others still raise them? Starks on both sides. Yeah, I talked about that a little bit earlier in the stream. Um, it makes sense. I agree with you that, yes, the Night, well, the Night King, the, the others would raise the, um, the corpses, but 
my best guess is that the crypts are protected in by a magical field in the same way that Blood Raven's cave was on the show, and so they won't be able to sort of get in there and do that. Um, Shannon T says, what is the reach of the knowledge of the three-eyed crow? Can some Valyrian secrets be known by Bran? Um, so this seems to be limited to Westeros. Um, it's not 100% clear because we, we haven't been told everything yet. But this does seem to be in the same way that the Weirwood network seems to be just in Westeros. It seems to be that that's the limit of the knowledge and power and all the rest of it. So certainly uh, Bran doesn't seem to have sort of headed off over to Shy or Bravos or anywhere like that in his uh, weirwood travelings. Um, so no, I don't. I, I, I don't think he will get unless he looks at stuff in the Citadel. Then uh, I don't think so. Um, Dominic Vaughan says, "Do you think the essence of Brandon the Builder is potentially preserved in one of the statues or the Weirwood Network? Was he a three-eyed raven?" I think there are two possibilities here. I think either he was the sacrifice, the original sacrifice that Bran saw um, when he went back in time through the Weirwood tree at Winterfell, or he is uh, in the crypts as all of the Stark lords, uh, lords of Winterfell were, and he will have been one of the ones who was raised to fight the Night King, uh, the Night's King, um, the 13th Lord Commander of, of uh, the, the Night's Watch. So that's um those are the two options that i have for him i don't think that he's going to come back this time this is what i'm trying to say um uh, adam smith saying jamie rested his head on a weirwood stump when he had his fever dream yep he absolutely did so um yeah there are certainly weirwood stumps are around as well and that there there are um that's high heart he was there so there's a lot of um weirwoody magic there um uh, rosie talking about the roots of the network being underground can being connected yeah i think that that's uh, absolutely right i think they're all going to be um we'll find that the the, the weirwood networks from north of the wall to south of the wall are definitely all going to be uh, connected um Andrew Kay saying, and I think I'll probably take this one as the last question, do you think both horns will be blown in the Winds of Winter, Dragonbinder and the Horn of Winter? I would love it if that happens. Um, I think we will see Dragonbinder blown in uh, the Winds of Winter. I think we will see, um, and then that's almost ready to be blown. That's making its way over to the dragons that it's intended to be controlled. Um, the Horn of Winter, I think, will be used in defense of Winterfell, I think Winterfell will come under attack in A Dream of Spring rather than the Winds of Winter. So I think that'll be next time. So that's my uh, my aim. I think that they will probably work out, or at least start working out what the Horn of Winter is and what it can do towards the end of uh, the Winds of Winter, though. Um, okay, uh, guys, I think I'm going to end it uh, at that point. Um, if you are watching this later uh, on uh, Not Live, then somewhere around about here is going to be appearing a link to my Patreon page. So if you're interested in supporting the channel uh, or getting access to some stuff I do just for my patrons, uh, that's where to click. Somewhere around here will be appearing a link to other live streams that I have done uh, over the last uh, few months and years. If you're interested in that, please do click on that playlist. Guys, I'll be back with a live stream next Thursday. If you're interested in Westworld, then my Westworld coverage starts this Sunday at 5 p.m. EST with a live stream, a pre-show live stream. Uh, it will be me, Hacks Dogma, and Justin Thomas uh, previewing episode one of season three. So that's it. Take care, everyone, and I will see you again soon.